Hello and welcome to Altitude. Today we'll be talking about the future of aviation. I'm Russell Porter, your host, and today I'm joined by Martin Rolf, CEO of Nats, and Simon Hockard, Director General of Canzo. Hello, Martin. Hello, Simon. Great to have you here. For those of you watching, please do submit your questions for Martin and Simon into the chats and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, but talking of questions, Martin, one for you straight away to get us going. You have been Nats CEO since 2015. What still excites you about doing such a responsible job? Thank you, Russell. Good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody who's joined and, and to Simon. Um, so what excites me about in the role? I think it starts with it being an exciting job, no matter what, right? You know, every, every, every year we're moving you know, two and a half million aircraft through the skies of the UK. Um, it's a big responsibility, but it also makes it exciting. You know, you know that every day we need everything to work pretty much perfectly in order for it to actually deliver the service, whether that be safety or quality of service that we know our customers need. Um, but I think the other thing is there's, there's two other things for me, I think, that really make it a special job. Um, one is the people, and I'm sure every industry says this, but the people we have in this industry, whether it be aviation, ANSP, whether it be sort of the wider supply chain, are really passionate about the subject. Most people are really into aviation, um, and I think that just makes it all a bit special for us. You know, the number of times I've met with people who want to talk about which version of aircraft they last controlled and that kind of stuff, it just I think it just adds to the passion and excitement within it. The third thing for me is that no two days are ever quite the same. Um, we often sort of joke about the fact that every day we have to do the same thing, i.e. You know, deliver the service, but every day brings new challenges, whether that's new operational challenges, you know, things failing, new things happening, new systems coming into operation, new airspace, new flights, new users, all the things that I'm sure we're going to talk about, but there isn't a day that doesn't go by that is actually typical as in if I look at my diary yes there's things in a routine yes there's things that happen every month every year whatever but every day there's something a bit different you know if I look at today one of the things I had this morning uh, was a briefing on what we're doing next week in Geneva on our stand for uh, airspace world so it's just things like that there's always different things going on and there's no opportunity to get bored and for me a job where you never get bored is the best kind of job. You, know, you want to get up in the morning, you want to come to work. So it's all of those things and probably more, but that sort of gives you a flavour, Russell. Fantastic. Thank you, Martin. Um, you mentioned Airspace World there. Um, turning to you, Simon, um, we're on the eve of the next Airspace World show, the biggest event in the ATM calendar. Um, what are you excited about seeing next week? Hi, good morning, Russell. Hi, Martin. Uh, I'm excited about the whole week, quite frankly. Um, I think Airspace World this year will be bigger and better than, than last year. Um, for those of you that don't know about Airspace World, I suppose it's 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 the biggest event in our industry um, in the year. Uh, we've got ATM, AAM, airports, defence, regulators, near space, you name it, everybody that's involved with Airspace will be at Airspace World in Geneva. In terms of excitement, um, I suppose it's, there's a, num a real high level, it's meeting people. You know, we're going to get hopefully seven to eight thousand people turning up um, across the week so it's getting everybody together to have the right conversations about the right things we've got nearly 270 speakers talking about huge amounts of different content from 140 different companies from 130 different countries so it is truly truly global and we're going to be talking about things like ai digitization Cyber security, cross-border operations, sustainability, and I could—I mean, I could have a, a list as long as your arm, probably. Um, but uh, but the, the, at, towards the end of the week, we've got a really important day, and I think that's equally what I'm excited about, and that's hearing from young people. And there's young people in our industry about and, and understanding how, as an industry, we can attract and retain perhaps the next generation of ATM professionals. So the whole week jam-packed full. I'm excited from start to finish. Thank you, Simon. We're certainly going to talk about some of those topics and themes that you raised there as we go through this show. Um, we're going to touch on quite a few of them. So, but starting with new airspace users, um, Martin, we are, I think, experiencing a step change in the aviation industry um, with new types of aircraft taking to the skies, drones flying beyond the visual line of sight, EV tolls electrifying the airspace. Um, through to al high altitude pseudo satellites. What does this mean for air traffic control? Um, so I think it means it, it means that big changes are coming. I, I think I'd probably say 
we are on the cusp of a step change. So I think, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time talking about it as we rightly should, because there's an awful lot to do in preparation for it. Um, there are obviously already things happening. And, and I was, I'm reminded of something that was said to me a couple of airspace worlds ago. I might be the last one where we talked about new use and somebody said, well, hold on a minute. They're not really new. They've been around for a while now. I think what we haven't seen up until now is it becoming ubiquitous. You know, we do not see thousands of drones operating in beyond visual line of sight. We haven't seen lots of high altitude programs, but they're all coming. Um, I think for air, for air traffic control, it, it's a pivotal point. And the reason it's a pivotal point is we have focused largely, not exclusively, but largely on one group of users, which is commercial airlines. And we communicate with them person to person, you know, a person on the ground speaking to a person in the cockpit over VHF with some other bits and pieces. Yeah, we've got radar screens, we've got, you know, lots of flight data and all that kind of stuff. But broadly speaking, it is a human to human transaction. There is no doubt that as we move into this new world, that is going to change. Now, it might not change to things like EV toll immediately over the mobility. That will probably still, there'll probably still be some elements of that, particularly as they come online and they've still got pilots on board and so on. But there's clearly no way we're going to be have person to person communications between you know, drones beyond visual line of sight and air traffic controllers. Those are going to have to be systematized. And I think the challenges we've got are, are we going to, one of the challenges we've got is, are we going to do that by segregating all the airspace and saying, well, that's fine, you can do it, but only in this space here. Um, or are we going to do it by integrating everybody together and allowing everybody to use the same airspace, but recognizing the safety and operational challenges that, that brings? I'm in favour of the second one, largely because I think the technology exists and we can do that. It's a big shift in the way we think and do it. But I also think that, and it's particularly true for a country like the UK, we're not a big place, right? If you start dividing up the airspace, it's already pretty tricky. If you're a GA pilot, for example, a leisure pilot, it's a complicated airspace to navigate. And there's lots of bits of it that you can't fly through very easily. The more we segregate, the more we're going to restrict how everybody can use the airspace and that for me doesn't feel sustainable and I mean sustainable not in the green sense although it will have implications there but in the the airspace is there for everyone to use so I think we are going to have to apply ourselves to new ways of technology or new new use of technology with new partners so we will have to have partnerships with these new users whether they be drone operators whether they be EV tail manufacturers service providers and we're going to have to find ways to integrate them into the system, but in new ways. And, and we've, we've got some of that actually on our stand and, and without keep referring to what we're going to do next week. Um, we've got a lot of things going on there around how we're doing trials for medicines moving, about how we're doing things around sniffing for methane in the North Sea, around uh, oil platforms and gas platforms. So all of those things are going to require us to deploy new technologies. And I think that's the exciting bit in all this is we're going to have to have a step change. Thank you, Martin. So in order to take that, get to that step change, you talked there a little bit about that human to human interaction that's required in today's aviation industry. So, Simon, um, do you think that the traditional ATM industry is moving quickly enough to make way for these new airspace users? Uh, uh, sounds like a loaded question, uh, Russell. But uh, uh, <laughs> so I think ANSPs um, uh, have a real challenge, actually. Uh, if we think about, so we're post post pandemic and the growth of what I would like to call heritage or traditional uh, airspace users is growing and is growing fast. You know, we're, we're, we're pre pandemic levels uh, and it, it, it's continuing to grow. So the capacity crunch to, is is back back to where it was pre COVID. So you've got that growing. Alongside that, you've got all these, you know, airspace users and some of them are new, some of them around. Um, all wanting to share a finite resource called airspace. I agree with Martin's uh, point about integration. I think integra integration is the only way that we're going to be able to accommodate everything all at the same time. Segregation is, is fraught with danger. So NSP has got its chance. They're trying to deal with growth with what they've always been dealing with. And they got all this new stuff that's coming online that they've got to try and fit in with everything else as well in, in the same amount of airspace broadly. Um, so that's a massive challenge. Do I think the industry is moving fast enough? Honestly, no, um, it's not. I think we're making good progress. I think you know, there's lots of cross-industry communication and participation. 
Uh, we got something called the CATS Global Council um, in a complete air traffic system global council uh, that we've done, led by Canso, but it's across the whole of the industry to try and get actually the whole of industry to talk together. That's the new, the old, the current, and the bit in the middle, ATM, at what ANSPs do is the glue that holds most of this stuff together. Um, so I think um, the right conversations are being had, but these new, and I, I'll say new, you know, uh, uh, actually uh, what Martin said is right, they're no longer new, they've been around for a long time, but they're now really becoming much more um, uh, available, I suppose, to come into uh, come into airspace. Um, they've got a huge amount of capital behind them, massive amount of capital investment uh, behind them, and that will force change. So we're going to have to speed up. We're going to have to speed up to be able to accept these and integrate these users and create new services for them. There's loads of barriers to overcome, and I'm happy to talk about all of those, but we must move quicker or else it will become segregated and that will cause more problems than it's worth. Thank you, Simon. And, and, and sticking with you for a moment then, um, you talked about the whole industry. Who, you know, from your kind of global perspective that you get through Canso, who's leading the charge in, in this area around the world? Um, oh, apart from Canso, obviously, that, um, you know, it's, it, we got the Cats Global Council, and I don't mean it as leading charge. I mean that as in it's a, it's a body of the whole of the industry that's trying to create a vision of the future, or has created a vision of the future uh, for 2045. And now it's trying to get everybody creating the roadmaps and the deliverables. Now, Canso can't implement anything, and nor should it. Uh, that's up to industry uh, to be able to do that themselves. But we're trying to do that. Um, try and encourage implementation leading to that vision. So that's important. Uh, and that is a global, that's people from all over the world and all walks of life are involved in that, including uh, people from the Silicon Valley. And, and, and I mentioned that for a reason, because that's where a lot of the investment from the tech companies is coming from. Um, so they are leading the way in terms of new vehicles and new types of operations that they want to see. However, new services that are going to be required for those, they're not leading because that's what the ATM in the inverted commas uh, needs to do. There are some first movers out there. We've got Air Services Australia. You know, they're, they're doing, um, I think with Frequentis, I think they've got the, the huge programme uh, of deliverables there for um, digital air traffic management uh, and looking to, for the influx of drones that they're expecting to, to come along. Nats, and, and I'm not just saying it because I'm on the, on this with Nats, but Nats will be presenting next week at Airspace World on, on AAM and BV loss drone operators. You know, Again, leading, world leading from that perspective. So, and if I go to, to the FAA, I've got um, in, in the US, they're doing a huge amount of work with the drone industry on, on trying to make sure, again, that they're integrated rather than segregated. So it's pockets of stuff all over the world. And um, what we need to make sure is that we don't try and reinvent the world in every single place. You know, we can all learn from one another to accelerate the implementation of these globally. Thanks, Simon. Um, Martin, whilst they're perhaps not new, when do you think that we'll see routine operations for drones flying beyond the visual line of sight and indeed perhaps EV tolls as well, the AAM aspect? Um, I think, well, first of all, there's probably one group of people that we, that we haven't talked about here that are worth a mention before, we, before I answer that question, which is the regulators. A lot of this is obviously tied up in regulatory um, uh, well, getting regulatory approval. Um, so it's not just the industry and perhaps the service provision form or, or the, the users or the manufacturers. So that's a big part of this. So with that in mind, um, there are already trials going on um, for BV loss. So for example, the one I mentioned up in Scotland, I don't know whether I mentioned it was in Scotland, but um, Project Kalis where we're trying to, well, we are actually using um, drones in a BV loss situation to deliver um, medicines to uh, difficult to reach communities on islands and such like. Uh, and there's there's talk of doing that also down uh, in the south of the Isle of Wight. So there are things in the UK added, the ones I talked about going into the North Sea. So there are already things happening when it comes to BV loss and drones. Uh, I think the EV toll stuff, well, everything I hear is it will probably start, if not at the end of this year, the start of next year. Now, I think that's slightly different because what we're talking about there is almost certainly going to be uh, EV toll um, with a pilot. So it will be more of your traditional airframe. Um, so probably, not necessarily, probably treated a bit like helicopters, 
to start with and integrate it into the system in that manner. And that's probably very sensible because we all know how to deal with helicopters. And from an e-detail perspective, from a manufacturer's perspective, obviously they want uptake on this. And quite rightly, they're, they're probably nervous that actually you don't automate these things from you know, zero to 100% on day one. So I think we are going to see urban air mobility EV tolls starting next year, um, possibly this year. I think high altitude platforms, uh, the same probably next year. Um, space launches, more space launches, near space and so on. Um, although I'm slightly less, what's the right word? Slightly less concerned about those. And, and the reason I say that is because Although there could be a lot of space launches, they will still be a relatively small user of the airspace compared to some of the other new users that we're talking about here. Um, so I think it's all coming in the next few years. I think the move then to, for example, pilotless EV toll or pilotless UAM AAM is probably still a fair few years off. It seems to me that, and this is just my opinion, it seems to me that we're probably going to have to crack the driverless car one first purely from a public perception perspective is my guess as in I think that once people become accepting of getting in cars where you no longer need to drive there is probably more acceptance of getting into a vehicle that doesn't have a pilot I mean we've obviously seen these kind of things on railways before and such like but they do take a, a little bit of getting used to um, and I think from an, from an EV toll perspective or from a manufacturer perspective what you can't afford to have is bad publicity on these things. So I think that will probably take longer. But I think somebody once said who was much cleverer than me, and I can't remember who it was, that when new technology comes in, it takes longer than you think, but it changes things far more than you could ever anticipate it. And the, and the mobile phones are a really good example of that. Yeah, we all thought mobile phones were amazing because we could use them to talk to people whilst we were moving around. And now we barely use them to talk to people. We use them for literally everything else. I think some of the stuff we're seeing here is going to fundamentally change the way we live, you know, work, move around, play, whatever. Um, I think it's all coming in the next five years. Will it all be at the same level in the next five years? Probably not. There'll be sort of early movers and, and later movers, but but it's all coming in the next five years in some form or other. Thank you, Martin. It certainly is an exciting time, and I think the you know, that sort of theme of disruption is really evident in uh, in the airspace industry at the moment. Um, you both mentioned uh, used the word integration on numerous occasions, and I think it's it won't be possible to integrate all airspace users without um, airspace modernisation. And uh, Martin, one for you. In the UK, we're implementing an extensive programme of airspace modernisation. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, um, so we've already done quite a bit, um, particularly upper airspace and particularly uh, in the north over Scotland uh, and then in the western approaches. So sort of Devon and Cornwall, the, the, the transatlantic sort of routes. Um, airspace modernisation actually, or the idea of airspace modernisation predates most of the new users um, on the basis that obviously airspace tends to be quite fixed. Um, you know, airspace was sort of designed, at least in the UK in the 1960s, you know, at the start of the jet age, really. Um, I think I seem to recall that the basic airspace of the UK was designed for 80,000 aircraft a year, 80,000 movements a year, something like that. And we're now at two and a half million. So, you know, we've managed to get quite a lot through. And obviously it has adapted and changed over that time, but it's still broadly the same. Um, we're changing the free route airspace and the upper airspace, but actually the biggest problem is close to the ground. And being very UK specific for a moment, the the hardest areas are the terminal manoeuvring areas, TMAs, uh, and the hardest one of those is the London TMA, where we've got <laughs> five international airports and six runways all within sort of 20 miles of each other. Um, changing that particularly close to the ground is really challenging. First, because you have to come up with a design that actually works for everyone, by which I mean all of the airports get what they need. Um, and of course, it's not just what they need now, it's what they might need in the future. Then you've got to add in the new users piece you talked about. Okay, how do we make sure that we don't effectively design a system that is absolutely brilliant for the existing users, but pays no attention to the new ones? Difficult when you don't quite know when they're coming or actually what the business models might be. And then you've got the biggest problem of all, or the biggest challenge of all, which is consulting with those on the ground. Um, we have a pretty comprehensive, but it's very complex and time consuming process in the UK for consulting with people who are overflown or people who might be overflown. 
And it's a bit like planning and permission. You know, it is very time consuming, very difficult. Most people don't like the idea of being flown over. And that's before you even get into yeah, most, of these, <laughs> most of these are around. Most of the issues are around airports or below sort of 10, 10,000 feet. Um, having said that, once you start to put in new users, that could be much lower. So you could be you know, having a drone fly over your house to do deliveries to your next door neighbor. I don't think the system of planning, if you like, or consultation has really thought about that at all. What are the rules around privacy? What can you expect? What is reasonable above your house? What is reasonable in terms of EV toll? You know, if that flies over your garden five times a day, you know, transporting people to the airport or to the local um, football stadium or whatever. I don't know is the honest answer. So we are embarking on this huge program. It's a 10 year program of airspace modernization. We know we have to start on it. We know that it needs to be more structured and cater for more users. Um, but the challenges are significant. I mean, I think we calculated for the London TMA. We will have to consult well with the airports. We'll have to consult with something around 35 million people. Um, that is an enormous undertaking and of course also fraught with politics. You know, there's general elections, there's local constituencies, you know, everybody has an opinion on this and a lot of those opinions are contradictory as in people don't want to be overflown but they want to have capacity. They want to be able to go to their local airport and get a cheap flight and connect to wherever. So there's lots of competing priorities and then you add into that the sustainability piece in that we want to make all of this much more sustainable green flying. You know, we want continuous descent, continuous climbs, eliminate holding, all of the things you know, that trajectory based operations and so on would suggest are very sensible. So it's probably one of the biggest programs we have on our portfolio, um, but without doubt one of the most challenging and I suspect very similar for other countries. Martin, thank you. That was a fantastic UK um, view of airspace modernisation. And you mentioned other countries. Simon, um, how does the work in the UK compare to elsewhere in the world? Uh, fascinating question. I think I've, since I joined Canzo and you travel all over the world, the biggest thing that I've noticed is actually there is real regional differences uh, around the world. So it was actually even real regional differences in Europe. Europe is probably one of the most diverse uh, regions in terms of north, -out, north, north, south, east and west. But around the rest of the world, it is very different. The challenges, whilst the challenges are very similar, moving aircraft um, from A to B safely, actually how they do airspace and how airspace is constructed, particularly with neighbours, international neighbours, is very different depending on, on which part of the world that, you, that you're in. Um, I think Nat, Nats with the UK is unique actually is unique in terms of that it has a, the really complex TMA operation as Martin's been talking about. It has the en route um, you know uh, uh, operation. It also has the ocean, it also has transatlantic and that's pretty unique for one ANSP to have all those different types of airspace uh, challenges uh, and therefore you know, if I think about you know looking at across the North Atlantic when they're losing ADSB and so on and so forth now that is is a big, a fairly big step actually and, and lots of other countries are looking and, and, and watching and understanding so I think that's because of its uniqueness and because of the some of the stuff it's doing it is still widely recognized as being at the forefront and doing some really good stuff um, actually in terms of its, how, how it uses its airspace and what it's trying to do and you know, many, many NATS uh, people are involved in the Kanzo work group sharing that expertise and sharing those those skills and ideas and learnings with the rest of the countries all around the world. So uh, comparing comparing is, I think, with other countries is always fraught with danger uh, because regionally they're very, very different. But there are specific stuff, you know, as it, you know, we talked about CCOs, CDOs and so on and so forth and technology that's used that actually that still can be shared across countries wherever they are in the world irrespective of the region. Thank you Simon. One of the key themes of the airspace modernization program certainly in the UK is that of sustainability and I know that ICAO has set a target for aviation to be net zero by 2050. Um, Martin what role does ATM have to play in achieving that target? I think we've got um, <clears throat> we've definitely got a role. Uh, it's, I would say it's quite a big role but we probably need to be realistic. It's by no means the biggest role in terms of the sustainability of the sector. 
yeah, there's been a lot of talk and anybody who's been to any conferences recently will know that SAF has been probably the biggest topic. You've really got SAF, hydrogen, that kind of thing. And all of those things are probably quite a long way off. I mean, SAF is obviously in existence now, but not in anything like the quantities that it needs to be in order to make a big difference to the industry. And I think that's where ATM has a role to play. I mean, estimates vary, and this probably goes back to Simon's point about it's very difficult to make generalizations, or if you do make generalizations, you know, you run the risk of it not being right. But somewhere between probably four and 10%, depending on where you are around the world, of the sort of um, wasted fuel, uh, and therefore CO2 that doesn't need to be uh, emitted, probably comes from the air traffic system. Now, there's lots of causes for that. Um, and if you take holding, holding is a really good example. Holding aircraft is terrible for passengers. It's terrible for the environment in terms of yeah, wasted fuel. And it is also the only way to make sure at the moment that you get the most out of every strip of runway. And sometimes the runways are the biggest constraints in, in our constructs. So it's very good for that because it means you've always got an aircraft that's ready to land, which means you're not wasting time and space. If we can find ways using technology and which which we are doing with things like demand capacity balancing and so on, then we can start to make some real changes in that three to 10 percent. The advantage of that three to 10 percent is it's addressable now with the technologies we have now, with the understanding of airspace, the understanding of aircraft performance, all of those kind of things. It's all addressable. Doesn't make it easy. Um, eliminating holding goes back to the point we were just talking about with airspace modernization. So those aircraft you know, will have to fly somewhere else and we'll have to make sure they're scheduled appropriately and streamed appropriately. But all of that technology is in existence. It's more about putting it in place and operationalizing it and operationalizing it in a way that works for our customers. You know, it is no use to our customers if we say, look, we're absolutely brilliant um, at we're going to be absolutely brilliant at giving you no holding, but by the way, your capacity is reduced by 20%. That's not what the customers want. What the customers want and need is continuing to increase capacity and, and, and doing that with more efficient aircraft, but making sure that there is not a, you know, not a gallon of wasted um, jet fuel as part of the process. We also have to then think about that in the context of the conversation we just had, which is the new users are going to be there as well. So, so what happens when we're taking EV tolls into airport terminals, because that's the way that people want to connect between yeah, different airports or centers of cities and airports. So all of those things come together. The technology exists, probably not yet tested in a systemized way that would, that would be required for some of these things, but, but there's near term stuff that we can absolutely do. And I'm, I'm sure you're gonna come onto this, but, but Canto has been leading the way in some of the certification around some of that as well. So um, we are all, 100% aligned that this needs to happen. We just need to make it happen in a way that is um, in keeping with all of the other many constraints that that we have within the system. Thank you, Martin. I, I guess one of the constraints is actually that of the predicted growth for the industry as well. How do we balance the work to decarbonize against that predicted growth? Is, is that something that we can do? I think we have to. I mean, the, the one thing I will say about predicted growth is the numbers are almost always wrong, and that's not a criticism of those who come up with them. It's just the world changes and, and, and things happen. Um, we know, well, generally speaking, over the course of the, you know, sort of any 10 years, there's a certain amount of growth and there's almost always some kind of reset, some global thing that happens, whether it be a pandemic, whether it be a, a global economic crash or something like that, something happens with a bit of reset, but the overall trend is absolutely upwards. Um, I mean, I think probably the biggest challenge with growth at the moment will almost certainly be the aircraft manufacturers, particularly the two big ones when it comes to commercial aircraft, actually being able to deliver enough aircraft for the demand they're seeing. So the growth is coming. Um, I think yeah, that, that growth is good in many ways because Almost all of that is with far more efficient aircraft than are in the skies at the moment. Every aircraft that comes off the production line now is absolutely going to be, you know, probably an order of magnitude or, or certainly, you know, massive percentages better than anything that came off the production line 30, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So that replacement of fleet is, is excellent. And in order for that to happen, we have to be able to handle them. There's no point in ordering aircraft that can't be used. So we have to make it work. What I think that means is we're going to have some very interesting challenges and discussions about, OK, what are the trade offs here? And some of that is a bit societal. 
you know, as in, we've been very clear, our job is to make sure that any aircraft that flies can be safely accommodated and safely accommodated as sustainably as possible. Society will decide obviously how much people should fly and shouldn't fly. That's not, I think, our job to do. Um, but I think we absolutely have that responsibility that we need to find a way to, to, to maximise both. And actually a thriving aviation economy, which is sustainable, is absolutely good for everybody. Yeah, it's a, the, the idea that flying is evil is, is, is definitely not something I subscribe to. It actually powers economies, you know, and, and certainly it powers economies of island nations. So we have to find a way to solve both. Don't have all the answers, that's for sure. But you know, if I take that, we have, we have an absolute pillar and one of our four objectives or four goals for our 2040 strategy is to be carbon negative. Now the carbon negative piece is obviously our state, but within that, there's also the contribution we can make to the carbon reduction across the entire industry. I'll stop there, Russell, because I could probably talk on this subject for too long and I'm sure Simon will want to say something about it as well. It's a huge and a very important topic, Martin, so thank you. Um, Simon, um, Martin spoke there about the uh, leadership that Canso are showing on this particular topic. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the Green ATM accreditation scheme? I'm very happy to, but before I do that, I just want to say it's nice to hear Martin or the CEO of an ANSP talk about the environment in, in that way. It's, I think ATM, and Martin's, I'm not going to try not to repeat anything Martin said, but ATM has such a massively important role to play now. The big the big prize to getting you know carbon neutral in in the future is is based around other stuff you know SAF sustainable aviation fuel and everything else but that 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 four to ten percent that he mentioned to do that now obviously if we do it early it's a massive impact over a longer period of time so it's really really good to hear now um, so Canzo we recognise actually that ATM really the spotlight is, the spotlight's moved all the way around from airports you need to be more sustainable to airlines you need to be more sustainable and it kept swinging around but actually it's really slowing down is now focusing much more on ATM what are you going to be able to do in the short term and and the green ATM program is a is an environmental accreditation program it's the world's first but it provides ANSPs with an independent industry endorsed accreditation for the environmental efforts. It's actually done in collaboration with a UK company, uh, Think Research, and ANSPs are assessed um, with respect to their direct environmental impact as well as their efforts to facilitate the reduction of emissions by airspace users. In other words, their operational uh, impact. There's five levels. The fifth level is super hard to get. I hasten to add, it's, you know, it really is. You know, I don't know whoever's going to get the first, the fifth level, uh, but it assesses the maturity and robustness of of all an ANSP's efforts across 24 topics. Actually, it's 24 individual topics, and um, it's really, really important. We've we've done a number of accreditations so far, and they're all falling in around about the the, the mid range level three, which is really good. Actually, it means that those ANSPs. Are, are taking it are taking it seriously certainly taking the environment seriously taking sustainability seriously but there's more things that they can do and they're all all the ones that have been accredited so far already in action to get to the next level and that's that type of you know continuous development that continuous improvement that really this accreditation is is all all about so uh, and i suppose it's the measure of the success of this accreditation is the fact that um, Kanzu represents not just ANSPs, but lots of the suppliers to those ANSPs uh, around the world. It's those suppliers now that are looking and asking whether they can be accredited, whether they can, whether we can adapt the scheme for them to be accredited because it's becoming an important accreditation to have. And actually they can share it with their governments, they can share it with their country, they can share it with their customers to say, actually, this is what we're doing in service of being sustainable. And that's that type of momentum that I think adds huge dividend, uh, huge benefits to everybody that does it. So really positive and everybody should do it, obviously. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Um, Simon, Martin, and um, we've covered a lot of ground already and we'll soon turn to some of the audience questions. Um, before we do so, though, I'd like to touch upon one of the topics um, that you mentioned, Simon, in your introduction. You spoke about people. Um, and obviously none of this is possible without people in the industry, in particular young people and the next generation of aviation. 
Um, the industry is facing a significant skill shortage. We know this. Um, I found a really interesting fact. Uh, it said a recent study has suggested that a, a new civil aviation professional will be needed every four minutes over the next 10 years, according to estimates. Um, so they're big numbers. 300,000 more pilots are required, 300,000 more maintenance engineers and 600,000 more cabin crew. Um, I wonder what do those numbers look like for air traffic controllers? Uh, globally, uh, currently there is a shortage of, of air traffic controllers, um, globally. Uh, and again, in pockets there, there is enough in some countries, but broadly, uh, following the pandemic where lots of training was stopped, slowed down, halted, actually we're now, we're now behind that, you know, growth uh, of, of airspace users curve to try and get back to where we need to be for, for air traffic uh, controllers. I think uh, you know, it, but it's difficult. You know, it's difficult. It's, it's young. I, I make myself sound completely old or older than I feel uh, in terms of young people today. I mean, I can remember my parents saying phrases like that, but young people today have a different, have a different, um, sometimes a different way of looking at life, I think, you know, so in terms of attracting young people uh, to our industry, needs different ways of thinking about how we're going to do that and what sort of working lifestyle, what sort of lifestyle are they going to have whilst whilst being in um, air traffic, for, for, for example. I mean, um, I love this industry. I've been in it for years um, and everybody that is everybody that's in the industry loves it. We all know that very few people leave. You know, you, it's a very small world. It's like a it's like a very large family. People move around, but they very don't, of, don't often leave the industry. There's a reason for that. It's because actually it's exciting for all the stuff that Marta said at the beginning. You know, every day is different. Every day is a challenge. Every we're all looking for different solutions. It's all it's all very creative and 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 excellent. So how do we attract those new people in? Well, we're doing it next week in in airspace world, as I said at the front to try and attract those young people. But we do need more people. And the last thing why why I think we're probably a little short. We're still quite an invisible infrastructure business. Um, you know, we're the invisible part. People know people see pilots. They see people at airports. They see people. Um, um, all, all connected with when they get on and off a plane. But actually they don't see the people sat in a, in a building, often you know, hundreds of miles away from an airport, providing these, these services as a controller um, across, across these countries. And therefore, I think we have a responsibility to the industry to, to market, market air traffic, market airspace services in a different way to attract those young people. Um, because it is an exciting industry, it, there is so much change coming. We need their different types of thinking and questioning for all the sustain for sustainability purposes. These guys that are coming, they are interested in the future of the of the earth. We have a responsibility of the managers of these of, of, of this industry to actually leave a legacy to make sure that aviation can continue and be sustainable. So as that combination of people wanting it to be sustainable, we need to leave a legacy of such surely that's the right conditions to create a fantastic new workforce coming into the future so um for me it's exciting we just need to market it better i think thank you sam a wonderful response um and we'll look forward to seeing that focus on the show next week. What I'm going to do now is turn to the audience. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming in, and indeed they are coming in from all around the world, which is really exciting. So um, the first one's from Steve, um, and uh, Steve's asked, what improvements can we do to simulations to reduce time to validate controllers? Martin, I wonder if you might like to take this one. Yeah, by all means, I think this relates very nicely actually to what Simon was just saying. Because if I take air traffic controllers, actually there are, at least in the UK, uh, there's no shortage of people who want to do the job. Now, Simon's right, it's not terribly well known, but when we go out there and tell people about it, we get a lot of applicants. And often the challenge is, is getting through those applicants to work out who has the right aptitude, because I think probably everybody on this call knows that there is a large part of this which is aptitude based. Um, so I think the challenge we have is that it then takes a very long while to take someone from having no aviation knowledge to being a qualified air traffic controller who can speak to aircraft on their own. You know, remember, this is not like in a cockpit where you've got two people watching each other the whole time. They are doing the job as part of a team, but on their own. Um, and that takes generally for us, you know, anywhere between two and three years. And part of the problem with that is you have to experience everything in the live environment. Um, our simulation capabilities um, are 
much less advanced than those of the airlines. Now, it is different. And again, it goes back to that team thing. If you are in an airline, you can go and buy a simulator. There's lots of airlines out there. Therefore, there's a massive market of simulators. And you go and buy your 737 simulator or your A300 simulator or whatever. Um, and it's one person goes in there with the mechanics of the simulator around them and flies the aircraft and does the emergency procedures and everything else. Our simulations tend to involve 50 ATCOs, 20 engineers, a whole lot of data preparation. It's, you know, it's really manually intensive um, because what you're trying to recreate is an entire system. So I think what we're going to have to do is look at how do we go out and look at other industries? So I don't think it's the aviation industry. I think it's industries where they've had to create that synthetic training environment for teams as opposed to individuals. And if you do that well, and there's possibly use of AI and things like that in there, what we what, what our vision is, is at some point to be able to say to someone, you know, any controller, whatever point they are in their training or their career, if you want some additional training on this, that or the other or some additional simulation, go into this booth, plug in, select what you want and you get the training on demand that's you know tailored for your needs, your level of expertise, your sector or your piece of airspace or the type of traffic or whatever. Uh, and I'll give you a, a, a you know a crazy example here. Um, you know, one of the airports that we uh, we manage is in Athens. Many people won't have heard of it. Certainly, overseas viewers won't have heard of it. And it's down in the uh, in the southwest of the UK. Uh, very small, uh, very small airport where actually most of the aircraft are going there to be recycled. Um, there are so few aircraft flying in there that when we try and validate someone, we have to pay a local flying club to fly enough to give the controllers enough exposure to the live environment. So something clearly has to change there because that doesn't make any sense. Um, so simulation is a massive focus for us, certainly a big area of investment and unlocks one of those training barriers, if you like. Because I, I don't think there's any shortage. There's no there's no difficulty, particularly with air traffic controllers, because you don't need to have an engineering degree. You don't need to have a maths degree. You don't need to have a biology degree. You need to have a set of aptitudes, the right behaviours, and the ability to learn and therefore we can attract anybody you know anybody we should be a massively diverse organization in that sense engineering is more difficult because they need to have engineering degrees generally but i think when it comes to controllers if we can do more simulation then we can absolutely shorten the time from coming in to being valid and that will hugely help us with that shortage we've got coming up over the coming years Martin, thank you very much. Some really significant themes there then. So aptitude, experience, simulation, um, the synthetic training environment. You also touched upon AI as well. And we have a question from Alexander who has asked, is the replacement of air traffic controllers with AI solutions feasible? And if so, in what time horizon? Simon, would you like to have a go at that one? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, never, never say never, right? Um, but um, I think simply saying AI can replace air traffic controllers is, a, is, is fraught with danger. Um, I think AI can massively, massively assist air traffic controllers with, with the role of you know, providing safe services in airspace, and it already does. Uh, and I think that's the first thing. AI is being used all over the place. You know, lots of data being you know crunched and, and and so on, and lots of systems all over the world. So it's already there, and it's assisting and aiding now. That assistance and aiding will increase. So it will fundamentally change the role of an air traffic controller. It will look different in the years to come, without question. Um, but will it completely replace the controller? Not not in a, not in my lifetime. Um, I don't believe so. And I think if it ever gets to a place where it's nearly all AI, um, then we're talking probably decades away for that um, for that to happen. I think we'll see some significant change in the next 10 years. Uh, and I think, uh, but that's all will be to the benefit um, of the controller uh, in terms of, you know, it'll just give them more time to deal with the capacity that's required, you know, that we need to deliver sustainably, all the stuff that's been said all the way through this call. So I think it's all going to be there for good use. And it's all going to be there for, for a good reason, but to replace, yeah, not, not just yet. Thanks, Simon. We'll take one more um, question from the audience and then we'll look to wrap up. So this one's from Paul. Paul said, a historically capacity increase at airport TMA level, including reducing holding, has often been constrained by the investment needs at airports. How can we lever the investment levels available from Silicon Valley to support both the ATM aspirations and those of the EV drone industry? 
maybe even lever. Martin, would you like to say that one? Um, it's a it's a tricky question. I think it's so. I think EV toll is easier than drone. So if I look at EV toll, you know, it is likely that the EV toll um, suppliers, whether they be um, whether they be um, the actual vehicle suppliers running a service, or whether it be the sale of EV tolls to airlines. If that happens, there will be demand at an airport for those services. And if there's demand at an airport for those services from the airlines, then generally the airports are in a position where they would want to invest. Often the problem comes because the, airline, the airports want to invest in an airport and the airlines don't want to pay any more money for that investment, you know, or they want to pay as little as possible. I think if both those things come together, as in the manufacturers want to get EV toll in there and the airports want to and the airlines want to, yeah, there's never anything better than a, you know, a, 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 co a coalescence of objectives. So I think that probably is the easier one. Um, and as, as we've said, there is a lot of money out there in terms of backing this and, and they all want to see it operational. There's probably also quite a big price in being one of the first. So I think that part's easier. I think the drone piece is more difficult because generally speaking, the drones are going to be operating probably in different airports, sorry, different airspace and probably not in the airport environment as much. Um, I mean, you could imagine there might be some, there's probably, there probably are applications that I haven't thought of, but I think it would be very difficult to use drone um, funding, if you like, in airports, um, simply because I, I, I'm not sure that the outputs, you know, the, the financial output is in the same place. Um, so I think, I, I guess my summary would be, I think it's probably feasible for eVTOL. I think it's harder for drones, um, but, these are the sorts of problems that are going to have to be solved. We are currently consulting on how do we charge for services to other users? Because at the moment, in our model, the regulatory piece at least, yeah, the airlines pay for everything, and that clearly isn't a fair future. So these are all problems that are being grappled with at the moment. Thank you. Um, we've given you quite a grilling, both of you, I think, with lots of questions there. We've covered some <laughs> huge topics. Um, so one fairly straightforward question to each of you um, to close. Um, Simon, if you'd like to go first, if you could change one thing about our industry, what would it be? Only one? <laughs> yeah, you're just going to get one. OK, uh, so <laughs> I, I, I suppose that it's an easy phrase to say, but it's it's one, of, it's one of the things I think is the most difficult, and that is to fast track transformation, I think. And that doesn't mean to say that ANSPs need to get their act together and, develop, you know, implement change and everything else faster. It's the whole of the industry to be able to do that, including the regulations and the regulators, including the governments and the states. Um, and whilst doing all that, not forgetting the people, you know, we love in this industry, we love shiny new things, always have done. But actually, it's still a very heavily people based industry and we mustn't forget that so it's taking it's fast tracking transformation from a regulatory technology implementation and people point of view if we can do those fast and we can do those you know quickly and safely then actually we can grow together you know we can really grow together with the with the rest of the aviation industry which we all want and we all need that to be successful and it'll all be good but it's easy to say more difficult to do Thank you, Simon. And Martin, your one thing. I'm going to go, so this is probably a bit of a UK centric um, change, but I, I guess you've got to sort of, if you're going to change, you've got to start the change at home, right? Uh, and I'm going to be a little bit contentious. Um, and I'm talking about the aviation industry here, not ATM, although ATM is obviously a part of it. I think we have to do a better job of not arguing amongst ourselves. The aviation industry seems to love shouting at other parts of the aviation industry uh, in public, in the media. And I don't think that serves the public very well. I don't think it inspires confidence. I don't think it inspires people to want to get on a plane. Now, I don't think it stops people, fortunately, because the lure of travel is, is too appealing or too necessary. But I think we could do a lot better if we actually got along better um, and, and looked at what we agree on rather than shouting about what we don't agree on. Um, so that would be my one change, um, at least for today. Um, but uh, uh, there's probably many others, but but I'll go with that one for now. Thank you, Russell. 
Yeah, that's an excellent one. Thank you, Martin. Um, that is all that we have time for today, unfortunately. Um, so Simon, Martin, huge thank you to you both. Um, some fantastic insights that you shared with us. Um, this show will be available um, soon on demand on the Nats YouTube channel. Um, I hope later on today, I'm informed. Um, do please keep an eye out on our social channels for details of the next episode of Altitude. Uh, and in the meantime, um, thank you all very much um, for watching and goodbye.